On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the cross, the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the cross, the Exchange it some day for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the cross, the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the cross, the old rugged cross, and exchange it some day for a crown. Our lesson this evening will begin in Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 35. If you're in uh, the fourfold gospel, we're looking at lesson 91. Luke 14, 25 to 35, and lesson 91. Now there went out with him great multitudes. And he turned and said unto them, If any man cometh unto me, and hateth not his own father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. Whosoever doth not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, did not first sit down and count the cost, whether he had wherewith to complete it? Lest happily, when he hath laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all that behold begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, as he goeth to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and asketh conditions of peace. So therefore, whosoever he be of you that renounceth not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt, therefore, is good, but if even the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is fit neither for land nor for the dung heel. Men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is probably still in the area east of the Jordan River where he had went uh, to get away, if you want to call it that, from the 
uh, religious leaders and their constant uh, trying and testing to see uh, how they might trap him up in his words. And as we were looking last week, Jesus was teaching a parable uh, in uh, the supper uh, that was prepared and how those who were originally bidden to the supper began to make excuses. The religious leaders had been uh, in the process of time as well as the Israelites in general preparing for the coming of the Messiah. The general invitation to uh, the kingdom and the marriage supper and the beginning of the church was in the hand of the religious leaders. However, when Jesus began to prepare them and call them, uh, these religious, religious leaders began to make excuses. Uh, and again, we went over the fact that some of those excuses, if not all of them, were pretty lame. But again, an excuse is only intended to make the person giving it feel good. Uh, we, we think that the excuse is going to clear us in the eyes of others, but a, a, a actual excuse really only makes us feel better about what it is that we don't want to do or that we feel like we want to do. And so after having spoken to them about the parable, and talking to them about preparing for the kingdom and how that many of them who were invited would not partake of that, but others who would come from the highways and byways and other places, which would also include the Gentiles eventually. And so while he was still there preaching and teaching, uh, even though he was trying to put some distance uh, between him and many of the multitudes, we're still told that there went out with him great multitudes. In a time when there was not radio, television, newspaper, telephone, telegraph, email, all the things that we have today. It's still amazing how fast people were able to find Jesus uh, when he would depart and go to a different city, would go into a deserted place, go over into the area of the wilderness trying to get a little breathing room. Uh, they still managed to figure out uh, where he went and the multitudes would follow along with him. And so in Luke's account here, we're told that while he was there, there were great multitudes that were with him as he sought to travel and to move. Uh, it's interesting because Luke doesn't say a multitude, but he said great multitudes. I don't, you know, Luke's like, I, I don't even know how to define this. Uh, you know, generally speaking, we're usually talking about multitudes, or sometimes it might say something like much people. Uh, but in this particular case, and as we're moving from three years into the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, as we're in that final six months leading up to the crucifixion uh, and, and really not even that much. We're, we're really getting closer and closer, probably not even six months away. There are these great multitudes of people. He has been through the area and regions of Galilee around the Sea of Galilee and many of the cities of Galilee. He has been in Judea and he's traveled through, <coughs> excuse me, the cities of Judea preaching and teaching. 
And he has spent time on a couple of occasions probably with uh, individuals of Samaria uh, speaking to them about the kingdom. And based on the number of people that he had healed, uh, people who were still looking for him to uh, provide some kind of miracle, blessing, whatever they were wanting, Luke says by this time it just amounted to a great multitude. You know, I, I, I have trouble because sadly growing up, we've all seen movies and television programs about this. And of course, one of the things about television and movies is every extra that you put on uh, the film set, the lot, has to be paid. And so when we see these programs and movies and things about Jesus, we see several, we see a lot, but very seldom do we ever see what Luke tells us here, great multitudes. And so because of that, many times our view of things sadly is impacted uh, by what we have seen in those programs, just like uh, anybody who's ever watched the Ten Commandments and and watched, you know, there there was about two million people that went through the Red Sea with Moses. But if you watch the Ten Commandments, I'm not sure you're going to see uh, two million people there. Uh, and so extras cost money. That's the point. And so when Luke says great multitudes, and notice that's plural, it's not just a great multitude, but it's great multitudes, which tends to imply that there were so many that there would be what we would think of today as different encampments of people who were following him, who were, again, setting up their, their place for the evening, the night, whatever. And when Jesus was there and people knew where he was, they just kept coming. They just kept coming. And he would be there and they just kept coming. Some would go out and they would tell their friends and neighbors that he's over here. And so uh, there were those foot runners, so to speak, who were the news agents of the day, the criers. And so Jesus has these great multitudes of people who are following him. And as like any other time, People are impressed with numbers, but numbers do not always reflect the situation that you have. Uh, you know, I, I wish that all the numbers were reflective of those who were devoted and committed, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we take attendance on Sunday morning and of course we count uh, most churches count the babies and and uh, even since wherever tier three are assembled uh, Jesus said he'd be in the midst of them so they even count Jesus uh, and since God's everywhere they count him and the Holy Spirit too and and they they just want to make sure him numbers accurately represent uh, all of that. But just like this, Jesus begins to address the multitudes and we begin to understand that not all of these people that are following Him are what we would call disciples of Christ. They are not learners, students, and they are not people who are going to devote their entire life to Him. And so, from time to time, Jesus would introduce 
thoughts and ideas which kind of helped, if you would pardon the phrase, separate the chaff from the wheat. And so he turned and said unto them, If any man cometh unto me, and hateth not his own father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now that's pretty strong. And people have tried to dress it down. They've tried to adjust it, you know. But it says what it says. In, like I said, our previous lesson, we were looking at the fact that there were those who were bidding to the marriage. They knew it was coming. And then they got the invitation, all things are ready, you know, come to the feast. And then they began to make excuses. And then they had to go out. And here it's kind of interesting, you know, when you look at that, all these things were being prepared for them. Everything was being made ready. But when it come time to say, come, all things are ready, come to the feast. We find out that not all the people that we thought were going to be there were going to be there. They began to make excuses and all of this. So Jesus begins to address certain things here. And it seems harsh, but it's also a matter of serious nature. Anything that gets in the way of Christ is a hindrance. The whole idea that we get from the Scriptures is, of course, that the husband and wife should be faithful to God. They should bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The idea is that everybody's got their house in order and as one big happy family, we're going to follow Jesus all the way into eternity. But that's not really the way it ends up happening. And we get in positions and situations that test our loyalty to Jesus. In one place, a person asked Jesus, let me go first and bury my father, and then I'll come follow you. Now, I don't think his father was laying dead in the bed, and he had to go and literally bury him. And the reason I don't think it's literal is because for the Jews, the body was washed, wrapped, prepared, and in the grave within 24 hours. So... Um, and even faster if they could get it there. So the, the question wasn't about, can I have 12 hours? Can I have eight hours? Can, can I go and literally bury my father? But the question really is, you know, let me go take care of dad until, you know, he passes away. I've got, I feel an obligation to him. And once he's passed away, once I've buried him, once I've kept my, uh, responsibility to him, then I'll come be your disciple. But you see, Jesus wasn't going to be around with that opportunity, maybe even until his father was dead. Jesus was going to die on the cross, and then it was what it was. And so he was going to lose his opportunity. Jesus said, No man having put his hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And so when we get into to these verses, are you going to be my disciple for how long? All the way or until? Is there always going to be an until? I'll be your disciple, Lord, until 
And then when I get that mess cleaned up, whatever it is, I'll be your disciple until. You. And when I get that mess cleaned up, I'll be your disciple until. You. you don't understand my family obligations, Lord. And so Jesus was looking for people who were willing to lay down their lives in devotion to Him to spread the Gospel to those who were lost and dying. And so the point of this is, we're not talking about until. I'm not talking about you'll be my disciple until your father gets sick or till your mother gets sick and after your father passes away, then you're going to need to take care of your mother. And, you know, if, if your sister isn't married, then you're going to have to take care of, of your father's responsibility. You're going to have to be a father to your sister until you arrange a marriage and all of that and your brethren and, and, and it just goes on and on. When Jesus says, will you be my disciple? He means from now on. Now, He's not saying that we have no responsibility to our mothers and fathers. But the question is, if we're going to be a disciple of Christ, how devoted are we to that? And... Really, if you don't plan on being really devoted to that, all you're going to do is mess it all up. You're going to get all delighted and excited, and then somewhere along the way you're going to lose all that. You may never get it back, even when whatever the until is, you may never really get it back. And... You know, Jesus is very equal in all this. He says, you even got to hate your own life. You know, people have plans. They have goals. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do that. Most people that I have ran into have some kind of goal in life. And that goal, that career, that destination, that point... It's usually like, I'll try to do this and I'm going to try to do that. And I'm going to try to figure out if I can get both of them to coexist at the same time. And Jesus said, a man can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. A man will either hate the one and love the other, or he will love the one and hate the other. I mean, that's, that's just kind of the, the way it goes. So Jesus says, if you're comfortable in your life and your goals and all of those things, again, until push comes to shove, and you know we could go into a lot of detail, but over the years I've heard people say, well, you don't understand, I've got to work. I don't understand why a Christian would accept a job that's going to keep them away from the church. In other words, it's either yes or no. There's no in between. Jesus said in Matthew 12, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And so these, these are difficult times. Jesus is running. You know, there comes a time when at the start of Jesus' ministry, he had three and a half years. So he can kind of ease his way into some things. He can, can kind of just let the multitudes build up, let them figure things out for themselves. But now we're past the three years. We're running into the crucifixion. He don't have time to sugarcoat things anymore. So either get with the program or get off the train. And so... You know, he's not saying you can't have a job. But what's more important, the job or the church? 
He's not saying that you can't have a family, but what's more important, the family or the church or the kingdom of heaven? And again, if they're not supporting you and they're not encouraging you, then they're like that proverbial mill wheel which is chained around your neck. And you can try to run the race, but, you know, it's going to be a lot harder. And so Jesus says you need to sit down and count the cost. Even your own life, because many in the early church were called to give up their lives literally. Herod slew James, the brother of John, with the sword. He intended, likewise, to kill Peter, but God delivered him. Stephen, who was a man full of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of Jesus Christ, became what we know as the first martyr Many Christians were beaten and imprisoned, especially under the persecution of soft Tarsus. And he said, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. That is, he voted for their execution. So when Jesus said, even your own life, what happens when push comes to shove? What happens when you're put in a position like many of the early Christians were. If you renounce Jesus and declare that Caesar is Lord, we will exempt you from the arena. We will free you and turn you loose to go about your business. But if you insist on continuing to claim that Jesus is Lord, you will be one of the contestants today in the arena. So what you're going to love the most? What if it costs the life and death of your family just because you wouldn't renounce they decided that your entire family would suffer because of that. If you love your father, mother, wife, daughter, brother, sister, family, or even your own life. So what if you gained for your own soul? You just So it's it's a uh, you know it's it's not an easy thing. And besides that, there's just difficult times that everybody goes through in their life. What will that do? What have you determined to do? Will you stay with Jesus, whatever the storm is, as long as the storm's there? Will you be one of those people like Job's wife who's best advice she could give him was, why don't you just curse God and die? Look at you, man. You're miserable. We've already lost all of our children. You've lost all your possessions. You're sitting in a fire pit scraping sores with pieces of broken pottery. It ain't like you got a lot to lose. Curse God and die. Job says, even if he destroys me, I will trust in him. That's pretty powerful faith. The patience of Job is not that everything went well. Everything went pretty bad for him. The patience of Job is that no matter what it was, you know, his advice was basically, you know, naked I come into the world, brought nothing into the world, I can't take nothing out. So again, blessed is the name of the Lord. And so Jesus says, 
Whosoever doth not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus had a cross to bear, and that was his cross. And that's the cross that ended up on Mount Calvary where he died for the sins of the world. Peter had a different cross to carry. But it was a cross none the same. They may not always be literal. They may be figurative in nature. But Jesus doesn't say that I have to carry everybody's cross. But Jesus says, everybody has a cross to bear. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. It, it's part of the discipling process. And so the cross is a place where we die. Romans 6 says that we're buried with Christ in baptism and that old man of sin is put to death and we rise to walk in a newness of life. Uh, Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 1, if you be risen with Christ, talking about being risen out of the waters of baptism, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then when Jesus, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with Him in glory. And then He uses this word, mortify, therefore. And the word mortify is the word we get for mortician. And the word mortify means to put to death. Your members which are on the earth. And then He goes into a discussion of the various sins, temptations, and things that would keep us away. So crosses, you know, they, they're, they're a painful thing. And so to kind of put things into perspective, he has a couple parables here. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he hath wherewith to complete it, lest happily when he hath laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all that behold begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. There is no small print with Jesus. You know, I have a rule in life, the smaller the print, the more time you need to spend figuring out what it says. I watch all these commercials on TV, and I'm sure you probably do also, who promise all kinds of rosy things and fantastic products, and we're just going to do all the world. But then there's this whole paragraph of stuff too small for anybody to even be able to read that's on the bottom of the screen. And theoretically, what that means is the small print takes away everything that they just told you. The interesting thing with Jesus is He doesn't have any small print. Jesus didn't hold anything back. I mean, anybody ask, one guy says, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Jesus said, you know, the birds of the air have nests, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man doesn't even have anywhere to lay His head. I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. You still want to follow me? I don't know where my next meal's coming from. You still want to follow me? When my clothes wear out, I'm sure somehow it'll be provided, but I don't know where all that's coming from. Do you? Jesus was very honest when people said things, Lord, you know, what thing can I do that I can have eternal life, the rich young ruler? Jesus says, well, you, you know the commandments, you know, and He speaks the commands. He says, Lord, all these things have I done 
all my life. What one thing do I lack? Now Jesus could have sugarcoated it. He could have bargained, bargained with him. But Jesus looks at him, spoke to him, whatever, and said, go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me and you can be my disciple." And he went away sorrowful because he had many riches. He counted the cost, and the cost just wasn't there as far as he was concerned. Now, I've always wondered, you know, again, the things that, you know, we, we never know. Somebody had to replace Judas. That rich young ruler might very well have been the one who took Judas's place. He might literally have been an apostle of our Lord and Savior. He might have had a book in the New Testament that leads and guides people to this very hour. What might have been? I don't know. He went away sorrowful because he had much riches and so that's the end of the story we just leave it at that he made his choice and he did that so jesus says anybody here he talks about building a tower towers usually were built for protection places that one could get above your enemies if you were attacked by your enemies you could retreat into the tower and defend yourself in the tower. Towers were built along the walls of a city so that the uh, watchman could keep an eye on the town and have a, a better view. Doesn't really say why they wanted specifically to build a tower, but Jesus said, let's suppose that you wanted to build a tower. Wishing doesn't make something so, does it? I wish we had a tower, so we're just going to go out and build one. Wishing don't make it so. Jesus said, you know, I know, we all know, that if you were going to engage in a building project, whether it's a tower or whatever it is, tool shed, doesn't matter. Nobody wants to start something that they can't finish. Because really it makes them look stupid. And that's really what Jesus says if you look at it. Because this man began to be to build a tower, but he did, couldn't finish it. And so people who came by, it became a monument to his stupidity. People mocked him. Look what stupid did. He spent all that money on all of that. Don't have two nickels to rub together. But by George, he has a third of a tower finished. And so they began to mock him. They thought of him as being stupid. Jesus says, if you're going to do something, you need to count the cost and make sure that you have what you need or that you have a means by which you can get that. He uses another parable here. He says, or which king, as he goeth to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. You know, I, I like the old way of doing things. The king, the general, whatever, they were right out there on the point with their people. Ain't nobody sitting 3,000 miles away looking at a computer screen of a map making decisions. These guys are right there in the front. If we get our clock clean, my clock will be cleaned just like everybody else's. And Jesus proposes two kings which 
are about to come to wars, things that in the Middle East, that just seems like an everyday thing. If it's not Palestinian and the Jews, it's uh, this group, that group, on and on. The Middle East is just a place of war. That's all they've known. And Jesus takes something that they were quite familiar with, and He said, what king that is facing a battle against another king, knowing that the numbers are not in his favor. I mean, here he says he has 10,000 and the estimated troops of the other king is 20,000. Does not sit down first and try to calculate how good my soldiers are versus how good his soldiers are. I mean, you know the story of Gideon. You don't always have to have a great number as long as God's with you and you got what you need. You, you can do it with less. But Jesus said you have to think sincerely and honestly with yourself. And if you think more highly of yourself, and your troops than you ought to think, you're going to get your clock cleaned. You're going to lose. Jesus says sometimes you have to surrender to the ultimate, even though that be the case. I don't want to suffer death. I don't want to die on the battlefield. I, I can't. I mean, it will be a waste of 10,000 lives. So Jesus says the, the right thing to do, as hard as it is, is to send an ambassador to the other king asking for the conditions of peace. In other words, what do you want to get me to surrender? What stipulations will you put upon my surrender? What will happen to me? What will happen to my soldiers? What will happen to my kingdom? And again, you can negotiate many different things. But if you close your eyes and jump in blindly, we know what the end result of that would be. These are difficult things that Jesus is telling these great multitudes. I mean, after all, Jesus is not going to be around to heal them. Now, the apostles will have the gift of the Holy Spirit. They'll be able to continue to heal and do those things. Uh, but we don't have a lot of references where the apostles were feeding 5,000 people at a time. You know, that's not the way the early church did it. They went and sold the things that they had, put it in the common treasury, laid it at the apostles' feet, and they used that for the daily needs, the daily ministration of the church. So Jesus says, So therefore, whosoever he be of you that renounceth not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That's the cost. Jesus gave His life for us. And we were unable to save our own. But in turn, Jesus says, if you want to be the partaker of that, then you have to give your life back to Me. Kind of helps you to understand how some of these people that we read about in the book of Acts, how Paul and Silas and Barnabas and all of those, even when shipwrecked, Paul gives us that list about the times he received stripes and scourged and shipwrecked and in prison and, and in fearfulness and all of that. Why in the world would you keep going? In Acts 14, we find Paul stoned and left for dead Theologians still are not sure whether he actually died or not. But 
as the crowds dispersed, Paul rose up and him and Barnabas says, let's go back to the churches where we've been and see how they fare. <laughs> or let's just get on a boat and go home. I mean, how many times can you be stoned, scourged, beaten? Later on, Paul's going to end up and Silas getting beaten and thrown into prison. And they're going to sing in the middle of the night. So you have to figure out whether or not you've got what it takes and you'll commit what's there. Paul and Barnabas go back through those cities. They appointed elders in every city. They stayed around long enough to look at the situation, see who was qualified, put elders in the church. They just kept on going. They didn't give up. You know, I don't want persecution on the church. I don't want to put us in a position where, you know, we have to make those kind of decisions. But we see that the ones who accomplished a great deal gave a lot. They gave up a lot. They fully focused themselves on the things of Christ. And when we look at the church today, we wonder why the church isn't growing, why the church is like it is. Maybe if we had more people who had really counted the cost of discipleship and in their heads clearly defined what they were willing to do for the cause of Christ, we might have a better idea of what we have to work with. We assume that every Christian who names the name Christian, we assume that every one of them are 110% devoted to the church and Christianity. But the sad truth is that's, that's not the truth. And so when we assume something, we all know what that does, what it makes of us and others. And so Jesus says that you know, time's up. I don't have time to play games anymore. I don't have time to sugarcoat things. I got to get to, as my mama would say, the nitty gritty. Let's cut to the chase. You want to be my disciple? It's all in. If you can't go all in, you can't be my disciple. If you can't use the things that you have in a way that brings honor to me, it's just not going to work. He's not saying you can't have a house, but how are you going to use that house to the glory of the Lord? Not saying you can't have a car, but how are you going to use that to the glory of God? Not saying you can't have a job, but how are you going to use that to the glory of God? Something we have to think about. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the cross, the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old cross, the old rugged cross, and exchange it some day for a crown. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll 
I'll cherish the cross, the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the cross, the old rugged cross, and exchange it some day for a in closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.